For far too long, and to the detriment of our natural world, dominant culture has dismissed and ignored traditional environmental knowledge. For thousands of years before the arrival of white settlers, native peoples on Turtle Island lived in relationship with the world around them. The time to listen and to learn is now. How can we follow the lead of indigenous knowledge and people and move towards a more just world for both the land and those who inhabit it? Growing up in South Dakota, Megan Schnitker received a strong foundation in Lakota teachings and traditions from her parents, Charles Wayne and Mar Martha Bulbear. Megan is the owner of Lakota Made, a small business that provides wild plant remedies and eco-friendly personal care products, and is the executive director of the Mikado Revitalization Project, a nonprofit focused on preserving and sharing Lakota and Dakota culture and language through education and outreach programs. She lives in Mankato with her husband and seven daughters. I read that right, seven daughters. She just, she just had another one. Um, and it's fantastic to see the, the, all of you all together. <clears throat> She's an enrolled tribal member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe. Um, and Megan spoke at our conference the last time we had it in person um, when we honored women in the land. Um, and so I think that it does tie in uh, what she was saying back then actually relates ever more uh, to the conversation that we're having today. And so I'm both honored um, to, and excited to welcome Megan back to the stage. Thank you, Megan. I'll hold this because I'll probably trip over this thing. No, I'm good. Okay. Ha, madak yapi. Chante, washte, nape, chi use a big kushto. Tawapaha otawi, imachi api kushto. Imataha asampi, oyanke kushto. Um, Good evening or good afternoon, my relatives. Uh, my name is Many War Bonnets Woman. I come from the Milks Camp community in uh, on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. My uncle has told me that I need to write it down so I read it and so I speak slowly. <laughs> so I said, fine. <laughs> he says, you go through your greeting so fast that ancestors are like, what are you saying? And so he says, your audience is probably saying the same thing. And I was like, I probably agree with you. Anyway, so I said it slow enough. So when we were talking about reviving, reviving our inner connection and our biodiversity, all these words have deeper meanings. And so um, I wanna start with a, a kind of a Cliff Notes version. Y'all know what Cliff Notes is, right? Okay. Because <laughs> when I say this to younger generations, they're like, what is Cliff Notes? And I'm like, I am old. Um, <laughs> so a Cliff Notes version of our creation story starts when we um, are, our Lakota people, um, our Otechi Shakoi and our seven council fires um, came from the earth. And so we came from Wind Cave um, over in the Black Hills. And our story goes is that we lived underground. We were underground beings and we ate the vegetables that grew underneath the, um, grew from the ceiling or grew, grew from there. And we lived in ceremony and we were coaxed out of Wind Cave by Iktomi or our trickster. And when we came out, we were naked and we were afraid and we didn't understand um, what was going, what would, what the surface life was about. And so we, we relied on our relations. So when you say midakio yasin, we mean all our relations, not just our human relations, but our relationships to the, to the plants, to the fungus, to the rocks, uh, to the grasses, to the birds, to the every single, single thing that is living on this earth. And so we really relied on that in order to learn how to live on the surface. And so when we reached out to our relatives, the other nations, the bird nation, the deer nation, our buffalo nation, and they taught us how to live on this earth. And they taught us how to live in harmony with everyone else because we were new beings to this surface and we disrupted the ecosystem. 
We disrupted and changed the ecosystem, just like we are doing today. And so when we learned how to live in harmony, we learned not to that to use every piece that we were given and to not take more than we needed. And we learned how to use every piece, every bone, every hair of animal that we used for food or for medicine. And so when we were living in harmony, we learned that there was no waste. Everything was used. And so there was no garbage and we were nomadic people. And so we traveled throughout the upper Midwest and we left the area better than what we found it. And so we also lived near the water and we understood that water was the, was the giver of life, was the purpose of life. It gave everything life because we as humans are mostly made up of water. And so we needed to respect that water because it it's a very powerful being, that water. It gives life, it takes life, um, and it provides everything that we need to survive. I know that sun-kissed and that coffee is delicious, but <laughs> water, water is what we need to keep our bodies healthy. Because if we're, we're, we're surviving on sodas and juices and all these things that have, you know, processed sugars in them and dyes and all that other stuff, we're really damaging our own ecosystem, which is our body. And so when we learned how to live through, uh, live with our, with our different nations here, um, and our relatives here that taught us, um, uh, everything that we need to know to live on the surface, they taught us the plants that are used for medicine. They taught us the plants and the funguses that we use for food. And they taught us when to harvest these things. Everything has a season. That's why we have different moon phases. This is why we have, um, you know, different seasons. That's why we have different times of the day when people say in Indigenous people didn't have time. Well, that's not true. Um, <laughs> or or uh, the the term often uses is Indian time. Um, roll my eyes. I'm not from India. Um, I'm <laughs> and so <laughs> and so uh, everything had a, had a time and a season to be harvested. We didn't just go out and slaughter buffalo at any time of the season. There were certain times we took the buffalo. There were certain times that we went and hunted our elk and hunted the deer, um, even ate gophers and um, everything like everything under the sun, everything was a food. And so we respected those nations and we took them when they were not in their breeding season. We took them when they were not with children. We took them when they were not seeding um, because those seeds are the next generation. And we're just living here on borrowed time because we're just here for the next generation. And so I borrowed this time, I borrowed this land, I borrowed everything from my children and my grandchildren. And so in order for them to live successfully in the next 10, you know, that 100, 200, 300 years, I need to be more careful with my words and my purposes. And so we did what we, uh, what we call wild tending a long time ago. We didn't grow gardens, not not the Lakota, Dakota people, um, we did wild tending. And so we only harvested um, medicines that grew naturally in their natural environment. Um, and what we did with that was what we would seed save throughout the year. We'd be very careful about how many seeds that we took and we keep them in our pockets and in our, our medicine pouches. Um, and then we would do controlled burns in the late, in the late fall around this time actually. Um, we would do controlled burns in certain areas to mark where we were going to come back in the next season or a couple seasons later. And so we would spread those seeds after that controlled burn, and that would be our food and our medicine for the next season. And it wasn't, um, you know, what we consider farming now. Um, it was just after the controlled burn, we'd go through with our seeds and we'd lay them down and we'd go on to our winter camp. And so we learned that when we take care of our relatives, um, that we want to respect that relative when we want to show that everything that we're doing um, is in respect of one another, because that's going to be our food and our medicine for the next year. And so when we do, when we did controlled burns, it wasn't just in random spots in the areas. It was in areas that we were going to come back to um, for future camps. It was going to be uh, for not just our our specific camp, but for other nations that were coming through. And so we would purposefully uh, plant 
along creeks and rivers um, or areas where it was kind of barren out in the prairie because we traveled through the prairie often. And so um, we would do those things in that area so that um, we were taking care of the next generation. We were taking care of the next people that were coming through on the land. And so when we say Medakio Yasin, um, what we're doing is we're asking for attention. We're asking not for attention just from the people in this room, but for the people that are no longer here that are in this room, but for the, all the plant nations, all the animal nations that are around us. And we're asking for their attention. We're asking for their respect. And we're asking that um, they listen to our, our prayer or our words. And so that they can take those back and understand. There was a study done recently um, and I totally had this written down on note cards, didn't bring them, um, but there was a study done. Um, I want to say it was over in England somewhere where they did uh, that they have proven that plants can see, that plants can hear. And all us Indigenous people said, well, yeah. <laughs> And so, because um, we believe that they not only can um, hear us, see us, and feel us, um, is that they also feel our intentions. And so when we go out and we harvest or we talk with the plants or we're getting ready to go out and gather our food and our medicine, we make sure that our heart is in a good place. Our intentions are in a good place because we believe that when we go out and we harvest, those intentions, those thoughts, um, that energy that you have goes into that food and goes into that medicine. Some of you um, may, how many of you have actually like harvested your own pig, cow? A few of you? Do you do it when they're scared or stressed out? No, because it changes the flavor of the meat. Um, it's the same thing with our, with our plant nation and our, and our funguses. Um, if you go there with bad intentions, they're also scared. They're like, well, what's going on? And you're not giving that plant or that fungus the, uh, the respect that they need to let them know that you're about to take their life for your purpose. And so when we ask for their, you know, when we're, we're preparing ourselves, um, sometimes it takes a couple of days in order for us to get our mind right and our body right and our spirit right, our energy right before we go harvest. And then sometimes our elders say, I'm sorry, you can't go harvest right now. Your energy is not right. You're too rushed. And so we listen to our elders because they've lived a lot longer than us. They know a little bit more than us. Um, and they um, absolutely deserve respect because now as they're getting ready to prepare to go on to their next journey, we're doing the work that they did and we're taking care of the next generation. And so um, before we go out and harvest, even with um, Lakota made or personally, um, I don't take anyone that's um, had a bad time, um, even though we say that plant medicine is, is a spirit medicine, but we ask that we uh, that that person not come with us and that um, they just wait for us to come back. And so that we go out and we harvest medicine for them to help them heal themselves before so that they can go out and harvest with us again. Um, because sometimes even though that um, they're in a good place, those bad things that are going on in their life have an energy and we believe that they attach themselves to people. And so we don't want that negative energy to interfere with what we're trying to do, which is heal other people. And so we're really careful about who comes and harvest with us. Sometimes it's just me and my husband. Sometimes it's just me and a couple of my kids. Um, and then sometimes, you know, we all get to go. And then we take our bus. <laughs> and it's a really good time. Um, we start out early in the morning where we smudge ourselves. We, uh, I let everyone know which plants we're going to go get and why. And so, and we determine what time we're going to go. And so certain plants require the morning dew, some plants does, uh, require um, the afternoon sun, and some plants require the evening sun. They needed that sun all day to absorb and get ready for that big medicine, and we want to harvest them at their peak time. And so sometimes we start out in the morning, and we smudge, and we go out into the prairie, and we hang out and wait for that time. And then once that time comes, we go out and we give our traditional tobacco, our chinchasha. Um, chinchasha is not actual tobacco. Tobacco didn't grow up here. And so our chinchasha is actually um, 
it depends upon the, the, the spiritual leader that you listen to, um, but is comp comprised of seven different plants, sometimes a bark, sometimes a mushroom um, thrown in there, but it's a traditional tobacco. And so we offer prayers for that plant nation and we say, thank you for, uh, for your sacrifice. We're going to take you now and we're going to use you uh, to help heal the health the help help heal the people and to bring goodness back to their life, whether it's spirit medicine, it's physical medicine. Um, you know, we have to be careful with that energy that we're putting into that plant as we harvest it. And so we give our tobacco to the plant and we take just a little bit. We only take a, a little bit. We go on to the next area and we harvest just a little bit because when we take our plant nation, we're taking someone's food someone's uh, home and we're taking someone's medicine because it's not just us that live out there. There's all different kinds of bugs. There's animals out there and they use that food and they use that medicine. And so we have to be gentle when we walk, not only with, you know, with our steps into the grass, but we have to be gentle with um, what we're taking and making sure that we're not taking too much for, from an area. And yes, this stuff grows absolutely abundantly everywhere, but that doesn't mean that there's not an endangered ant somewhere or that there's a, a frog that needs that home in that specific area because that's where he thrives. And so we are very careful when we take our plants. So when we say sustainably and ethically sourced medicine, we definitely need it um, because we wanna be careful with our plant nation and our relatives. Some things that uh, my grandpa Albert once said to me, um, he passed away a few years ago and uh, he said uh, that you are never an expert, but you're always a student. And he says, if you ever claim to be an expert, that means you've stopped learning. And so he says, you never want to start, stop learning. And so he, and uh, cause he always called, uh, he always called me the girl with all the coffee because uh, when I would go to Lakota Studies Department at St. Igleshka University in Mission, it used to be just a cabin um, with just a few rooms in it. And um, Albert and uh, many others, uh, oh my gosh, I'm spacing out their names, but there would be about four or five of them that would sit in there and they just sit in there and speak Lakota and tell old stories all the time. And sometimes they'd miss classes and sometimes they'd make classes or sometimes you'd have to go find them to have your class. Well, I always knew where they were. And I knew that if I kept the coffee pot going that I could sit there for hours and absorb as many stories as I could. And so um, he always called me the girl with the coffee and all the questions. <laughs> so I said, yep, I'm here. And so um, he, and then uh, in that building, they could smoke. So they could chain smoke and drink burnt coffee for hours and they could do it all day. Um, and they would talk about, sometimes they debate on a look, the meaning of a Lakota word, because sometimes our Lakota words um, are like our plants. They're multi-purpose, depends upon the context. And so that you're using them. And so I would listen to them and that uh, there was a, I went in one day and I had a list of questions. And I, and Albert said, hope here she comes. Does she got coffee? And I said, I got your coffee. I got you the good stuff. I didn't bring folders. I bought you the good stuff. And he was so excited. And so him and Francis cut sat down um, and um, they sat down and they got their, you know, they got their pack of cigarettes out and they got their coffee and they're ready to go. And then they started talking about um, a plant that their grandma used to use because um, they were cousins. And so they grew up together. And so they sat there and they were like, yeah, it was, it was long, it was tall and it bloomed in the, in August. And, um, I said, it's goldenrod. He's like, yep. And then, uh, he's like, I can always count on you to tell me which the, he said the, the English name for it. And so he talked about it in Lakota for a few hours about how they used to use it. And he says, long ago, um, when we traveled around, he says, we didn't sleep on the grass. We didn't sleep on the ground. He said, the ground was on the outside, but what we did was we would have the grass dancers come and they would come and stomp down the grass where the camp was going to be. And then he said, then the women would come and they'd set up the lodges. And he says, man, our women, you wouldn't want to mess with them because they could set up and take down a lodge in seven minutes. <laughs> anyway, and um, if you've ever seen a, um, a, a tipestola or a, a, a lodge, um, they're pretty big and they're heavy and they're not they're not for the faint, 
you know, not for someone that's not, you know, I, I can't do it. Um, <laughs> I can do it with my brothers. Um, I'm the oldest um, of four and I'm the littlest one. And from here it goes up and uh, out. And um, I, <laughs> I am the littlest one. And we, my brothers and I, uh, we put up a lodge once by ourselves and I'm happy my dad was far away because we used every cuss word that we could think of at each other because we were so angry at each other. It took us forever to get that lodge up, but we got it up. Um, and then the wind knocked it down a little bit later. So we didn't get it up the right way. Anyway, <laughs> so Grandpa Elder said when after the grass dancers come and the women set up the lodges, what they did is they would go out, they'd send the young girls out into the prairie, the young girls that were getting ready for their women's ceremony. So they'd be about seven, eight, nine years old, and they'd go out to the prairie and they'd start gathering uh, mugwort, they'd start gathering uh, golden goldenrod, and they'd start gathering sage. And so when they came back into the camp, they'd go into the lodges and they'd take those plants and they'd take the sage and they'd put it in the different corners of the lodge. And then they'd put down uh, mugwort and motherwort and then they would take goldenrod and they put it down on the, on the ground around the area. And then they'd put their hides down for a carpet and then they'd put their beds down. And so that way that kept the, the mice out, it kept the insects out um, and it helped funguses from not growing. And so even though we ate most of the funguses, sometimes you don't want your funguses growing on your hides, then your hides spoil. Anyway, um, and so when we made our lodges, we made sure that, uh, that our, our main bedding underneath our lodges um, not only kept out, you know, the mice um, and the little rodents and our gophers, um, but it also didn't hurt the earth. And that when we left our lodges, we left those grasses there and then they came back again next year. And so that we left them there for not only the, the, our other relatives to come and eat and to make shelter with is that it biodegraded itself. And so when every year in the fall, I get very upset with the, with the human race, with the needing to rake the leaves. And it's like, you know, I understand that, you know, we are the dominant species here on earth, but mother nature's pretty smart and she knows how to take care of herself. Where do you think the soil comes from? It comes from those leaves. It comes from the grasses that have died. And so we really don't need to rake the leaves. We need to leave the leaves. And so that's what we did with our lodges is that we would leave the plants there and we would um, let the animals and our relatives come and take them and make new shelters or use them for food. And so we always made sure that our, our other nations were taken care of. And now we have permanent homes that take trees and plastic and they put them into this great place and it changes the ecosystem that that was there. And so now that we have industrial farming to feed the world, um, we have lost so many animals. I think we're in the what is it, the seventh or the eighth great extinction? Ninth? Sixth. Sixth. Okay, it's not that high. Um, it's still so pretty high. So the sixth great extinction. And so we have lost so many of our relatives that are no longer here because of the impact that we have on, on the earth. And so not only that is that I have read from multiple sources that we lose up to 200 plant species a day due to pollution, um, industrial farming um, and the human impact on the earth. And so we lose a lot of our, our medicines and our foods that grow naturally. And so when we're talking about um, growing food for ourselves is that we had it together a few hundred years ago, and now we're trying to go back to that. And so we're trying to create community gardens where we share food, um, we, where food can be free and food should be free. It shouldn't be, um, it shouldn't be uh, privatized. It shouldn't be something that only the, um, the privileged have. It should be for everyone. And that's what uh, Unchimaka or Mother Earth has taught us is that um, food and medicine should be free and it is out there. And so one thing that we also do um, is that with Lakota Made is that we wanted to do capitalism the right way. And so we not only wanted to revitalize our language, our culture, and our history, is that I wanted to teach the world about what grows in their backyard because all the plants that I use grow here, except for cinnamon. <laughs> that comes from down south. Um, but um, 
And so uh, what we do with Lakota made is that we incorporate our, our language, our Lakota language in, our, in our, the names of our products. We incorporate plants that grow around here. And so my goal is to work myself out of a job, <laughs> is to teach everyone. And I understand that everyone's going to go out and make all these things by themselves. Um, but to teach everyone that our, our food um, is out there and it grows in your backyard. Our medicine is out there. It grows in your backyard. Um, and to ask your neighbors to quit spraying um, because that spray, the, some of those chemicals can last up to seven years in the ground. And that's seven years, that's a generation. That's more than a generation. That is um, food that is lost. Those are birds that are lost. Those are insects that are lost. Those are humans that are lost because that food wasn't available. That medicine wasn't available. That mushroom wasn't able to grow so that that bird can come down and have shelter. That, um, and when that bird comes down to, to take shelter, then it didn't bring the seeds with it that was going to bring the next generation of flowers for the next spring. And so we don't realize our impact on the earth, that every decision that we have every day, um, you know, make, creates an impact. So I'm super excited that there was um, compostable plates used today, that everything that was recyclable. Um, in our home, we have glass and we have wood. Um, I hate plastic, <laughs> absolutely hate plastic. Um, for the amount of uh, girls that I have in my house, seven, um, plastics are definitely a detriment to their health because of the amount of hormone changes that happens every time you touch plastic. We often forget that a skin is the biggest organ on the body. And so in everything we absorb through our skin, whether it's someone's energy, it's a lotion, it's a fabric, um, it's an item, it's anything you can pick up, a plastic pen, you absorb something from that. Everything leaches something at some point, some capacity, and it absorbs into your skin and into your body and it affects the way that your organs heal. You are not work or work. And so there's a huge um, you know, issue with People that have irritable bowel syndrome, um, unhealthy guts, and unhealthy guts affect your entire body. There was studies done saying that your stomach is your second brain, um, and so that that also needs to be taken care of as well. So you need to be careful with the food that you eat. And so community gardens are incredibly important. Um, being able to grow your own food and know that it's pesticide free, and knowing that the people that grew it for you had really good intentions, and they had the, int the intention and the energy to feed you, whether it was for a few couple dollars or for your volunteer time, or it was um, given to you because you weren't able to afford it. And so food should always be able to be available no matter your income status, no matter your color, the color of your skin, no matter your, the cultural background, food should always be for free. And it is out there. It's out there for us to help each other grow physically, mentally, uh, spiritually. And so when we, um, we as indigenous people, we always wear, these are my hump paws. These are my moccasins. And so they're made with um, brain tanned um, elk hide. And then the bottom is horse belly. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we always made sure that when uh, when we walked on the on the earth is that we had that connection. And today we wear shoes with thick soles. We wear we walk on cement sidewalks, and we lost our connection to earth. There's lots of studies out there saying that going out and touching the dirt um, uh, grounds you and gives you vitamins and minerals that aren't available anywhere else also helps out with depression. So gardening, um, touching that soil and having that impact um, in your body and your mind and your soul um, brings you um, a sense of serenity. It calms you down um, because you're meant to touch that ground. You're meant to touch that plant. You're meant to be connected to that plant because that's where you come from. Um, it doesn't matter what cultural background you have. You all come from earth. We all come from earth. This is where we live. We are no more than, you know, we deserve to live here just as much as the ants, just as much as the frogs. And so, but we lost our connection to the earth um, through everything that we have done in progress. And so we have all these fancy buildings now and all these sidewalks. Um, we have social media that has lost, you know, think of the last time that you've touched earth. There's people that have gone years without touching earth. 
think of the people that live in bigger cities. Um, when was the last time they saw a tree? When was the last time they touched a plant? And how sad that they're that they're they are because they're not able to touch that. They're not able to reconnect with that. They're always saying, "Stay off the grass," you know, "Don't touch the grass." Well, we're supposed to. We're supposed to be living in harmony with our with our plant nation and with the all the nations that live out there and be being able to touch the earth. We forget that how important it is to touch the earth. It doesn't matter the season, but you have to go outside and you have to touch the earth. It's the best thing in the world. Go outside, sit on your lawn. Hopefully it's not all one type of grass and you have a biodiverse lawn, but um, <laughs> go outside and sit in your lawn um, and just listen to the grass and listen to the, the flowers. Um, even in this season, they still, they'll still speak. They'll still listen to you. Um, there's still plants out there that are alive. There's still funguses out there. There's still trees that are just getting ready to sleep. There's still um, birds out there. There's still a lot of life outside, even though they say that this is the dead season. Um, it's not, it's still full of life. It still has a beautiful ecosystem that is still going, even though a lot of the things that, you know, a lot of the lives that we see in the summer and the spring are asleep, there's still things going on. There's still lots of life going on. And so um, we have to get uh, kind of like decolonize our thoughts. When people say decolonize, um, I think about the things that I do in our home to decolonize, which is getting rid of the, the plastics that are in our home thinking about the way that I um, uh, uh, brain just died, um, <laughs> uh, function in society and the society that we live in. And so um, that I have a platform that I use to speak about getting rid of plastics and to connect with the earth um, and to think about what culture you originally come from, because we all come from somewhere. And that's really important and getting back to our cultural roots and thinking about the way that we used to integrate um, with, uh, with our food and our medicine, because um, I'm lactose intolerant. The joke is, um, is that we, we see how indigenous you are by giving you a glass of milk and telling you to walk uphill that the porta potty's at the top of the hill and see if you make it. Um, <laughs> that'd be torture. <laughs> <laughs> um, and some of you know, some, uh, some of you know me, uh, my 11, she's 11 now, my 11 year old daughter, Maisie, who's autistic and doesn't have a filter. Um, she's, she's not lactose intolerant. And the other night at dinner, um, she was like, well, why did you choose to be lactose intolerant? And I was like, it's not a choice, honey. <laughs> She's like, well, why, why are you and Elsie lactose intolerant? I don't know why you wanted to be like that. Like, I love cheese. And I said, honey, <laughs> that's just the way genetics works. Sometimes you're lactose intolerant, sometimes you're not. And the more native you are, the less lactose intolerant you are. Um, and so, um, but the point of that um, bit of laughter there is that um, us indigenous people haven't had cows as long as settlers have. And so our bodies cannot handle cow's milk, cannot handle cheese, cannot handle flour, uh, processed flours. We cannot handle sugar. That's why so many of us are diabetic. That's why so many of us have addiction issues is because of the, the things, the impacts that happened um, to our genetics. And so when we really think about how much um, today's society impacts indigenous peoples, it's great. I follow... Um, I unfortunately follow um, a funeral home from back home and the average age that people are, are passing away is 35 to 55. And that's over on the reservation. Our life expectancy, I believe, um, is 59 over on reservations, um, which is incredibly sad. It comes from addiction. It comes from di uh, diabetes. It comes from cancer. And it's because our bodies haven't had processed sugar, hasn't had um, processed flours. We haven't had dairy. And so we struggle with diets because our culture and our way of life was stripped from us. Um, and now we are struggling with getting back, uh, revitalizing our culture and getting back to our roots and getting uh, back to our, our connection with our food. Um, food is medicine. And so being able to go back out and learn our medicines um, is a big effort going on in indigenous communities. But it's not just about indigenous people is that um, 
everyone outside of the indigenous uh, culture also have problems with food. We have um, irritable bowel syndrome, we have body inflammation, we have arthritis. Um, I can go down the list um, as far as health conditions that are impacted by the food um, and the objects that we have every day. And so when we talk about um, caring for our relatives, um, is that sharing knowledge is something that we should all do. Um, Grandpa Albert once said that if someone says that something is too sacred to share, to run, because that's a colonizer thought, and that is teaching fear. And something that we don't have in Lakota culture is fear. And so he said that you should never fear anything that, um, you should never fear anything in the world because there's nothing out there that hasn't been conquered before. And so when he says that, when I say conquered, I mean that we haven't built a relationship with it. We haven't conquered that fear to build that relationship. And so he says, we need to rebuild our, all of our relationships with not only each other, but with the earth. And he says, working with each other, we need to realize and take away all the, all the, the fights over the color of the skin and realize the only thing that actually separates us is culture. And we, that should be celebrated. We should celebrate everyone's culture here. We should celebrate each other um, and preserve as much cultures as possible because there's so many teachings about reconnecting with earth and everyone's culture and everyone's culture around the world. It's about going back to and reaching for that connection to earth. Um, ancient cultures wor worshiped different uh, seasons and that's where a lot of our holidays come from today. And so the seasons were really important because that was different harvesting times. And so um, for us indigenous people, we followed the moons and we followed the cycles um, of the seasons. And so do you know that there's 13 moons? So there should be 13 months, but we only have 12. Isn't that weird? Um, <laughs> and so um, when we really dive down into why society is the way it is today, it comes back to consumerism. It comes back to um, people having too much wealth that are controlling the systems that we live in. And so um, one thing I never understood that was politicized was, was property rights. But um, one of the things that I want to do with my property is to grow all my food and to share it, to grow the medicine that grows naturally and share it. Um, if you know where I live, I live at the end um, of, a, of a street and um, all, the, my, all my neighbors are businesses. And I live there for a reason because then I'm not zoned. And so um, I can grow whatever I want. However, we have a neighbor that drives me nuts and calls the cops on me quite frequently. But anyway, um, <laughs> he doesn't like my yard. And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> uh, and so um, our yard is, is pretty wild. Um, you go there, there's food, there's medicine all over the place. Um, there's a giant kid gym over there. There's wood chips for mushrooms. Um, I shared pictures uh, right after the wood chips were laid down a couple weeks after the wood chips came down and we uh, threw down some mushroom spores and we were like, oh my God, waiting for rain and we're in a drought. Um, <laughs> and finally, um, a few days after, you know, if, if after you know, hoping for rain, hoping for rain, because once that rain hits those wood chips and those mushroom spores, man, magic's going to happen. And finally, the one, it was like a few days after I had cedar, um, my youngest, um, I had finally gotten a night's sleep and my husband comes and shakes me awake and he's like, you gotta come outside. And I'm like, you know what? I'm about to rip your head off. I just slept for the first time in like a week. <laughs> and he was like, no, you gotta come outside. And I'm like, okay, fine. So I go outside and he's like, you got to sit on the wood chips. And I'm like, I'm not going to sit. Okay. I'm sitting on the wood chips and I wake up and I, he hands me a coffee and he's like, look, and I was like, oh my God, wow. Look what we did. We had like 15 different kinds of mushrooms all over the wood chips and they were growing in these awesome, cute little colonies that were all over the place. And that's how we changed the ecosystem in our backyard. And so our impact is great. And so we don't have a dog. Um, our dog passed away a year after we moved here and he was like my best friend ever. Um, and, but what we have in our backyard are um, groundhogs, a family of them, like seven. 
And as much as I appreciate nature, I love nature. They eat my garden every year anyway. <laughs> and so, um, the past couple of years we have been, unfortunately, or actually I say, fortunately, we have been too busy to do a garden. And so the groundhogs now live underneath my back deck. <laughs> and so every morning it's like wild kingdom, you open the back door and they all scatter. Um, <laughs> it's pretty much entertainment for it's cheap entertainment for me, I should say. Um, <laughs> I don't watch TV, so I, I have to get my kick somewhere. Um, and so the groundhogs, we were sitting there and we were sitting there so quiet and we were like looking at the mushrooms and watching them change as the sunlight moved. Um, and we had the baby monitor. So we knew that nobody was awake yet. Anyway, uh, we were sitting there drinking our coffee. We were watching the mushrooms and all of a sudden the family of groundhogs decided to wake up and they came out and they were, um, uh, they were standing on the edge of the wood chips by, by the fence. And they were looking at all the mushrooms and they were like, what in the world is going on? Because they had a massive change when uh, Ethan brought the, um, what are those things called? Those little tiny bulldozers? Bobcat, there you go. Um, he brought the Bobcat and he, he took out half of the garden because our garden was way too big for, <laughs> for us. Like we could have fed all of Mankato um, and then some, but then we realized that's just way past manageable. So anyway, so we, he took out half of the garden that we weren't using um, and put down the wood chips. And so that changed their backyard a little bit. That changed, you know, totally scared the life out of them. And that's why they live under the back deck now because they're scared that Ethan's going to bring the bobcat back. Um, <laughs> and so they stood there and they watched, they looked at all the mushrooms and they were so happy. They were so happy. They were dancing around and they were rolling around in the wood chips and they were so careful not to touch the mushrooms. And it's like, how long has it been since they've seen the mushrooms in the backyard because of our impact on that little piece of land right there. And so, um, I have come to terms that they are my relative, that they, we just coexist on this piece of land. They're my little furry little best friends that don't pay rent. Um, <laughs> they should, um, for as much of my garden as they destroy, they should. Um, <laughs> but, um, and then we also have a family of possums that live back there and they sit on our back deck every night and they stare into the back door. So it's kind of funny how, you know, we go to zoos and we watch animals in cages. And then if you really pay attention, the animals will sit and watch us in our cages. Um, <laughs> so we're the possums nighttime entertainment because there's, my kids are running around wild and crazy. Um, and the possums just sit there in awe watching the chaos in my house. Um, but we have, um, you know, multiple families of different animals that are back there. Cause we not only have groundhogs and possums, we have raccoons and we have different kinds of squirrels. Actually, there's a gang fight of squirrels right now. We have red squirrels and gray squirrels. And so, um, if you go outside in the early morning, you'll listen to them fight each other and like run around in the trees. I told you, I don't watch TV. I need cheap entertainment. So, um, <laughs> so I go outside and I watch the squirrels and they fight each other. And sometimes the red squirrels win. Sometimes the gray squirrels win either way. We don't pick sides. Um, but we feed them all because they're our relatives. And so this year, um, our kids, uh, had pumpkins and they, we don't carve our pumpkins because we understand that those are food. And so we use eco-friendly paints or we make, um, make our own paints for the kids. And so they paint their pumpkins and usually we get to set them out and do the Halloween thing. Well, this year, um, the mass backyard family has decided that they were going to eat them before we got to, um, Halloween. So, uh, they, <laughs> Uh, we came, it was one Saturday afternoon, we came home and they had the biggest pumpkin over halfway gone. Um, and that was Saturday. And by Wednesday, the littlest pumpkin was gone. So all of our pumpkins had been eaten and completely de demolished. And after all the big animals had eaten the pumpkins, the birds came for the seeds. So we're going to have a pumpkin patch somewhere in the backyard. We have no idea where. <laughs> but we'll just find out and we'll have fun with it next year. Um, and that's kind of how we get our garden growing is that we allow nature 
to do it, do most of the work. And so um, that's what happened a few years ago when my uncle gave me um, pumpkins for the kids is that the kids painted them and we left them on the front porch and we let them rot and let the animals eat them. And then the next year, um, we had like 80 some pumpkins in the front yard and that's where, um, I got pumpkin puree for Diane a few years ago. And it was like three weeks of roasting pumpkins in the oven and then pureeing them and sticking them in the freezer. Um, we just got rid of that the last few bags of pumpkin puree from that long ago. It was delicious pumpkin pie, but I was super sick of it after a while, just like it's the, the, the zucchini mom, you know? <laughs> the mom that just started the, the family garden and has the abundance of zucchinis. Um, I was the pumpkin mom. And so I was handing out um, pumpkins and pumpkin puree to everyone forever. I was like, I don't care what you do with it, but you have to have it. <laughs> and so um, when we talk about, you know, taking responsibility for not only ourselves um, and what grow, grows around us is that we live, you know, we, I battled the groundhogs for years about my garden. I would try and trap them. And I ended up trapping squirrels. And anyway, the squirrels would get super mad at me. We'd argue back and forth about what's going on. Um, and I'd open the cage and they'd like bolt out of there and they'd yell at me from the trees. Um, after a few years of battling the animals in my backyard, uh, I remembered my traditional teachings of saying medakio yasin, that we're all related. And now we just live together in this backyard of nature. And I know not everyone is allowed that backyard um, greatness that some people live in apartments and some people have super small yards or terrible neighbors. Um, but we've kind of learned to just accept whatever lives in our backyard and we feed each other. And so sometimes our possums bring us dead mice to let us know that they're doing their job. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, or, or the raccoons, we're not sure which one uh, brings us the, the dead mice, but um, we're happy that there's no mice in our house, however. <laughs> um, and so we, we come to terms with that and we, we allow us uh, to live together. And so when we bring seeds home from other places, we don't plant them right away. We let them sit with us for a while. Um, and so I have a, in my dining room, I have this huge um, cat or, uh, bookshelf that's sitting on a table. And then there's a big bookshelf and it's full of jars of different seeds. And so every, every once in a while we'll go out to our backyard and we'll put out new seeds out there and we'll just let the wind take them. We'll set them on the back deck and we'll let the wind or the birds take them and whatever comes, comes. And so one of the teachings that we had, uh, growing up, uh, from my grandma Ethel is that, um, uh, um, what you need comes to you. And so she said, uh, she had, she was an avid gardener. Um, she loved to go out and, uh, be out in nature and she had beautiful flower gardens all over. And when I was little, I was like, grandma, how, you know, how'd you get all the, how'd you get your flower garden started? And she said, I took the packets of seeds and I put them in the bird bath and I let the birds decide where the flowers are going to be. And she said, and I let the and I, she said, I let nature decide where my flower gardens were going to be. And that's where they are. And she said, you know, we don't, um, our lawn is full of different kinds of grasses and we mow it for you kids to play on. But for the most part, we really don't spray and we don't plant grass on purpose. We let these natural grasses grow. And so a majority of her, of her ginormous lawn was clover. And so those were snacks. Um, the flower buds were snacks. And so we would always go outside and we always had uh, clover bud snacks. Uh, we had um, parsley. Uh, we had all different um, purslane. We had all different kinds of these um, snacks throughout the summer. And so we would eat those. And my grandma was also had her own garden that was down by the creek and she grew tomatoes and she grew every, you know, all your typical garden vegetables. Um, and I remember it never being in rows. And I asked her, um, cause I was really young. She was, uh, I think she was, uh, 42 when she had my mom. So she was, um, significantly older when I was little. And, um, she, uh, she said, you know, my girl, um, I don't like to plant in rows for one. I'm old and I don't walk in a straight line anymore. <laughs> and she said, um, uh, 
And she said, the other thing is that I let the plants do what they want to do. She's like, I planted those tomatoes years ago. And she says, every year I let a tomato plant get, I, there's one tomato plant that I don't pick. And I let that come back next year. And she says, sometimes it cross pollinates with the other, with the other tomato plants and we get something new. Um, and she said, you know, for everything that is here, it's been here for many years. And she says, I really don't tend to it. I just come here and I pick what I want and what I need. And I let the animals take it and I let the nature take it. And it gives me back, gives, uh, gives back to me every year. And so she says, I want to make sure that, you know, um, as you grow up and as you remember, and after I'm gone, that earth doesn't need us, we need it. And so she says, in order for us to live here, we need to remember that. And so she also said, um, when you're taking care of a garden or you're taking care of a food crop that you always leave some for not just the spirits, but for all the other living creatures that are around because they need food too. And they're super excited that you're growing something for them. <laughs> and so, uh, I just wanted to end with that and say, thank you. So you're saying my out of control garden is totally cool. Yes. Great. Um, it's always so nice to have Megan, uh, come and, and speak and to, to hear, um, a lot of these stories and everything. And so what we're going to do at this point is, is do what we've done before. We're going to allow, um, you all a little bit of time to discuss what Megan has said. Um, what has, what have you absorbed? What are some of the things that stood out? Um, and when we come back, um, in about five to 10 minutes, we'll, we'll just kind of see where the flow goes. Um, then that's when we'll uh, be able to ask Megan questions. So just a, a quick reminder um, that as you are discussing and you think of things, make sure to write them down on the piece of paper or on the cards provided. Um, and those of you who are online, just make sure that you're uh, writing your questions in and we'll make sure that Megan gets them in just a little bit. Different. All right, I think we're ready for our Q&A session with Megan. For those of you that are joining us online, uh, make sure that you're sending your questions via chat and we'll be able to take care of those. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so I think the, the first question, which I will, will, will start off with, is I can't seem to keep mice out of my house. How do you do that? Please tell us your secret. Feral cats. <laughs> Biodiversity. Biodiversity. Uh, that's serious. We, uh, the the possums and the feral cats in my neighborhood keep the mice out of my house. Every once in a while we go out there and we feed the feral cats, but we want to keep them feral because I don't want them in my house. Um, <laughs> um, but if they're in my house then they're not catching the food that's outside. And so what we do is we just make sure that we feed the, feed the animals every once in a while, and then they reciprocate and they keep the mice out of the house. And we know when the city comes around and catches the cats because then there's a mouse in the house. And so um, right now there's a mama cat and about seven kittens that are, that are living in our backyard. And sometimes we see them and sometimes we don't. And when we go a few days without seeing them, then we put food out to make sure that they come back. Um, and we also make sure that they are, there's always a water source out there, but we keep them pretty far away from the house, but we enjoy our feral cats and we wish the city would leave them alone. Um, but that's, <laughs> that's my secret. <laughs> I mean, it's tapping onto a, I mean, a, a much, it's not a, a silly question, but it's a seemingly simple question that taps into the biodiversity conversation for sure. Okay. Um, how can we leave things better than we found them? Some ideas or examples, please. That's broad. Uh, take it away. Um, so with our yard, when I moved to Mankato, our house is um, is or is one of the first houses in Mankato. And it's along the old riverfront. So the old riverfront bridge is in their backyard. And when we first moved here, um, Ethan had purchased it a few years prior and it was just a rental property. So they just kept mowing the grass in the backyard. But when we made it our permanent home, um, then we started to till up the yard because we wanted a garden and we wanted to, um, to clean out the garbage out of the yard. And so as when he tilled the yard, he found that, um, 
we found uh, blue glass pieces. We found pieces of TV. We found pieces of, um, um, what do you call it? The wagon wheel? Yeah, we found pieces of wagon wheel in the yard. We found every generation that has lived in that house put their garbage in the backyard. And so we cleaned all of it out and we had some pretty cool treasures. Um, and then a lot of it, we had to find different ways to recycle it or reuse it. And then there was some things that we had to be like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> uh, we need someone to come take this away. Um, and so there was, you know, we cleaned out our yard. And so before there was a hundred plus years, however old Mankato is, um, of garbage back there that people, you know, before garbage services and all that stuff, all that stuff was just in the backyard. It was buried. It was burned. Um, there was multiple layers of, of, uh, burn. So they would just take their stuff back there and burn it. And so we got all that garbage out of the yard. We did a giant garden and found out that it was way more than two adults and kids could manage. Um, and so we put the wood chips down. And so when we leave this place, if we ever leave this place, um, we plan to let the, the backyard just buck, just go. Um, there's tons of natural plants that grow back there. Um, some of them, we have no idea how they got back there other than the birds that we feed. And so we just, we're going to leave it to be a natural state instead of, um, that solid green ocean of grass, um, we just want it to be a natural yard. We want, um, and we're probably never going to sell that house because it's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. And so when we talk about leaving it better, um, if, and when we leave that house, we're going to leave that backyard, um, a beautiful ecosystem. And so, uh, my parents, their yard, my dad was very much um, a roundup king for quite a few years. Um, he still jokes about it and it's just a trolling back and forth anyway. <laughs> and so um, my dad was a roundup king for a, a few years. And after we were like, you know, this is really, he was like, well, where's all my birds? And I'm like, well, you're using roundup dad, you're killing your birds. And so he quit using roundup quite a few years ago. Um, my youngest brother is about to be 21. So it'd be about 20. 22 years ago, he quit using Roundup. And so, or, yeah. And so now he has a natural lawn, most of it's cl clover and natural gr grasses. And they have on the edge of their lawn, they have a beautiful nettle patch. I know people are like, ew, stinging nettle, but that's actually a really good food. And so, and it's a really good medicine. Um, and so uh, he's got nettle, he's got goldenrod, and he's got tons of mushrooms in his yard. Um, and now he's got tons of birds. He loves to bird watch in his half retirement years. He loves to bird watch. And so he brought all those back just by quitting with the, the roundup, quitting with the chemicals um, and letting things go. And so he quit mowing certain areas because he found out birds like to build their, there's ground birds that like to build their nests in the ground. And so he leaves those alone. And so he quit mowing in certain, certain areas. Cause he really likes that kind of bird. I'm not a bird expert. I don't know what kind they are. Um, <laughs> but anyway, they build their nests in the yard. So he's going to leave it better for when one of my brothers take over their, their house when they're gone. And so, and my brothers already have it planned out, planned out, um, that they're really going to actually let the whole yard go. They're going to just let it go back to its natural habitat and then put a walkway through it. And that's what my dad's eventual goal is, is just to have a walkway through the yard and let things naturally go. Um, my dad was given, um, a wapaha or a war bonnet a few years ago after my grandpa passed away. Um, so as a nacha or a um, hereditary leader, um, he says, I need to, um, I need to walk my talk. And so he says, I'm supposed to be a leader for the community, but I can't do that if I'm not doing um, what I need to do. Um, if I'm, if my home isn't clean or my shoes aren't clean, how am I expecting my community to have their shoes clean, to have their home clean? And so I need to be able to be the example. And so with that, he stopped using chemicals in the yard and started being more, uh, uh, reconnecting with the nature that grew around him because he lives in, um, milks camp and he lives in a river Valley and it, uh, Ethan loves it down there. I grew up down there and I'm like, it's a wasteland. Um, he easily called, he's like, Oh my God, Megan, it's so gorgeous. And I'm like, I lived here. <laughs> 
nearest grocery store is an hour away. Uh, there's no road rash. <laughs> and um, anyway, so I mean, they have deer in the front yard every morning. The turkeys, giant turkeys come down out of the trees every morning. There's squirrels, there's birds. And so since he stopped the, the roundup, all the animals, all the wildlife have come back to the yard. And now instead of just watching birds, he can watch um, the, the, um, all the animals, the, the deer, the, the raccoons, I mean, you name it, we, they have it down there, um, because they're wherever, where they live, it's all pasture land. And so there's no fight with the Monsanto sea that we have over here in, uh, Minnesota. It's weird going back to South Dakota. Cause then I'm like, Oh my God, there's cows everywhere. And here there's like, Oh my God, there's a cow. Um, but, <laughs> um, and so, you know, looking at the examples that I have in my life is, um, doing what we, we have done in our own homes, because we can't expect a community to create change. If our home, um, we haven't created that change in our home. And so, um, my dad has become, you know, uh, better about his, his home environment. I've become better about ours. Um, and then every time we are out somewhere, um, all our kids are trained, um, to pick up the trash that's everywhere. And so whenever there's trash on the ground, we pick it up and we put it where it needs to be. Um, we use the thrift store, uh, for all of our furniture. Um, we make sure that the businesses that we buy from are local. Um, we make sure that, um, we get as much plastic out of our house as possible. It's so hard when you have four different sets of grandparents and Christmas time <laughs> birthdays come. <laughs> we have piles of plastic junk in our house, but uh, we have decided um, that this year that we're pretty stern on our um, commitment to not adding to any more plastic in our home and have asked the grandparents not to buy anything for the kids this year um, to donate to their go to Disney World fund um, or to, you know, buy them an experience um, because I don't remember my favorite toy from when I was seven years old, but I remember um, going to Disney World when I was eight years old with my parents and I remember um, going on special trips. And so, uh, you know, walking our talk and chain making change in our home, um, trying to teach our kids and our next generation, um, that you don't really need this stuff. <laughs> and so, um, and then always going to the thrift store, the thrift store, the thrift store is like our favorite place to go. Um, and when we buy clothes or things like that, we need to make sure that, um, we're giving clothes away. And so we're living more sustainably. So leaving it better, um, better than what you found it, it's a learning process. It's a long process. We can only do better until we know better. And so um, every day you learn something new and you take something out of your home that's toxic or that's um, not no good. You can't beat yourself up for having that in your home, but you didn't know any better until you knew better. And so um, just getting to... Um, I guess just being aware and being able to open, to be open and learn, um, especially with your environment that you live around. Okay, somebody is asking, the drought was hard on my native plants. Do you have words of wisdom um, uh, about water conservation and tools? Oh, it's late in the afternoon. <laughs> Laura needs coffee. <laughs> Some days we, us moms just need like an IV drip <laughs> all day. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I can't stay up that late. I'm like an 830 person. <laughs> um, oh my God. What was the question? <laughs> I'm going to hand it to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> The drought was hard on my native plants. Do you have words of wisdom about water conservation and tools? Native plants have an amazing root system. And so when you leave native plants to do what they need to do, they get it done. Um, sometimes they go dormant for a while, but if you let them go, their root system can go eight plus six plus feet down into the ground where the water is. And so a lot of plants will curl up and be gone for a few seasons, but their root structure is still there and they'll come back. And so 
Um, we let our native plants go. We don't worry about watering them. Um, when rain comes, we're super blessed. But at the same time, um, native plants have survived here for hundreds of thousands of years for a reason. Um, this isn't the first time we've been in a drought. Um, these plants are used to it and they grow stronger actually if they have a little bit of stress. And so just like when you're in your garden and you're planting your tomato plants and they're pretty floppy and all over the place, but the wind comes and suddenly they grow some muscles and they're standing up straight. And so same thing with our native plants is that they may suffer for a little bit, but they'll be stronger for it. Um, they'll be a little more resilient. Um, and sometimes they'll pick up and they'll move someplace else that has more, that has a better, um, has their root structure is uh, more towards water. And so you have to let mother nature do what mother nature does um, best. And sometimes they don't need our intervention. Um, but like, if you're really worried and you really want them in a certain spot, um, sometimes like a trickle water system will work um, so that you're not using that much water and you're getting a little bit of water. Um, a lot of native plants really don't need a lot of water, maybe once or twice a month at the most, if you're trying to keep them in a certain spot. Um, but otherwise they have a really strong root system. You just got to let them go. Um, if they're really young, um, you might need to water them, but um, usually the older that they get, the deeper the roots get. Do we have any other questions? This will be the first time in history we've run out of questions. I have a question then. Um, so my question has more to do with this this concept of, um, you know, kind of talking about the the theme of the the conferences the concept of biodiversity, but not just in nature, but also in our social ecosystems. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, what your thoughts are on how that biodiversity can actually build resiliency. And if there's examples that you can give, and I know it's a really broad kind of take on it, but, um, you know, that concept of not just uh, natural biodiversity, but the concept of interconnecting the, you know, pe diverse people and things along those lines as well. No, I get, I totally understand what you're saying. And so, um, and I'll, I'll speak from experience is that I listen to everyone. I don't care if I disagree with them or not. How am I supposed to expand my knowledge, my experience, if I cut people out? And so um, the thing that is kind of a, a taboo or, or, you know, type thing is to listening to all sides. And so that's something that I do often because I might not, um, understand the other side or might not agree with them, but I prefer to clear up my ignorance by trying to understand them better. And so my group of friends is pretty diverse. Um, you know, we have, um, my husband's German, <laughs> um, very strong willed individual, very, um, well-read. And, um, then we have Claire, Emily. I mean, we have a, we have, I'm the oldest out of this entire, out of my entire friends group. This is ridiculous. I just realized this. Um, <laughs> I'm the oldest. And then we have, um, our friends that are younger. They're all from different walks of life and they all have different experiences. And we all sit at the table together and we all listen to each other. And we include my children because they have a different perspective. Um, as, from adults because, you know, our children, they're like magic. They're experiencing the world for the first time. And sometimes us old people totally get it wrong. And so I look to the three-year-old, the five-year-old, the nine-year-old, the seven-year-old, and I'm like, you know, what do you think about this? And they're like, and sometimes they come up with the perfect answer. And I'm like, well, why didn't I think of that? Oh, it's because I'm old and I'm close-minded. And so keeping a diverse group at the table means that everyone gets to get heard and that you get to hear all perspectives, whether you agree with them or not. It's important that every single person, human being that is living has a voice. And so whether they're right, wrong, and indifferent, you can't, um, if you close people off, they can't learn that they're wrong if they're not allowed a voice, if they're not allowed to ask the question. And so what I do is I, you know, I've gotten crazy racist comments being a Lakota person and a Lakota business owner in Old Town. But you know what? 
they came to my store and they asked the question or said the statement and they were either corrected or they learned. And so they leave the store being able to think that like, holy crap, I'm a racist asshole. And so <laughs> I don't let them get by with it. I don't let people get, get away with it. And so, um, but you, they had, I created a safe space for people to come and learn that their, that their way of thinking could be wrong. And I understand that I could be wrong in some of my perceptions. And so I invite conversations that might be uncomfortable to, and if you're not uncomfortable, you're not learning just like Sabrina said. So <laughs> if you're comfortable, then you're not growing and you're not learning and you're not expanding and you're not saving your community. You have to invite everyone to the table, whether you agree or not. And that's the way that you create community and that you create a community that is like-minded.